Welcome, welcome everybody. Good afternoon, good morning, uh, good evening. Uh, we're here live on uh, uh, The Nation, The Show. I hope you can uh, see me, you can hear us. Uh, we're live here today with our uh, show, which is uh, Profile Your Java Apps in Production on Red Hat OpenShift with uh, Cryostat. Um, I'm very happy to have uh, with me today two guests. One is Elliot. Hi, Elliot. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. Um, and I think uh, I we lost someone in, in the stream, right? I don't see any more. Uh, yes, uh, I don't see Andrew. Andrew, Andrew. Okay, Andrew, if you can join uh, join again, uh, we we are here uh, uh, to w waiting for you. But in, in the while, Elliot, welcome to this session. Then mention the Thank show you. every two Thursday uh, on. 6 p.m. set time, and, and then, then uh, we have it uh, also on uh, ET time. I see Andrew uh, just came. Let's see if uh, we can add it to the stream. So, hello, do you want in the while, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, so, let me just uh, start with some slides I have prepared. Great. Okay. Hopefully, everybody can see that all right. Yep. Uh, okay. So uh, yeah, welcome to uh, our DevNation Tech Talk on how to profile your Java apps in production on Red Hat OpenShift with Cryostat. I'm Elliot Barron, and uh, with me today is Andrew Azores. We're both senior software engineers at Red Hat, and uh, together we lead the Cryostat project. So if we had any, any luck uh, with Andrew joining again? Well, I see he is here, but uh, oh, hey, hey, Andrew, hey, welcome back. Hello, yeah, terrible timing. My Wi-Fi dropped out right as the stream started, so hopefully it's stable from now. No problem, <laughs> Helia. We were starting with uh, uh, sorry, Andrew. We were starting with Helia. Do you want to introduce yourself, also, Andrew? Sure. Yeah, as Elliot just said, uh, we're both senior software engineers at Red Hat. Uh, we both work on the crowd project, and we're really excited to show it off today. We just two point zero release publicly, um, so I'm sure Elliot's going to talk more about that. Yes, uh, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, so today, what we're going to be talking about, uh, going to have a, a brief overview of JDK Flight Recorder, which is also known as JFR. Uh, some of you may be familiar with that already. Uh, we're going to talk about what Cryostat is uh, for anybody new to the project. Uh, what's new in our, our 2.0 release that, that just came out last month. And then we're going to have a couple of demos. The first one is how to install Cryostat on OpenShift. And the second is actually using Cryostat to troubleshoot some of your Java applications. So firstly, about uh, JDK Flight Recorder, or JFR, uh, it's a profiling and event collection framework for Java. So it allows you to uh, gather low-level information about how your application is, is uh, performing. And it's built into OpenJDK, so it's uh, available by default in OpenJDK 11 and newer, and also in recent versions of OpenJDK 8. So if you have anything uh, since, say, uh, 8U272, which was released in October of last year, then you have GFR enabled by default. Uh, it also supports custom events. So on top of the, the events that are built into the JDK that give you some uh, internals on how on uh, specific JDK uh, metrics. It also has an API where you can register and capture events that are specific to your applications. So there could be things like uh, HTTP requests. And it pairs nicely with JDK Mission Control JMC, which you may have heard of. Uh, uh, so that allows you to actually like, manage recordings to, to start and stop them and to visualize all, these, all the nice information that you get from the JFR events. So uh, JFR has a few challenges in the cloud. So it was it was designed for, for local use. So the recordings are typically output to binary files. And th these files will reside on the uh, the same machine that you're, you're actually targeting to, to record. So you have to consider how, how do you get that, that recording out of the machine uh, to another machine where you want to perform your analysis. Um, so remote use is possible, but it's diff a little difficult to secure. So it uses uh, remote GMX to control and transfer recordings. And uh, there are some challenges with scaling it to large deployments. So typically, it's you, you would connect to one JVM and start a recording for it. But uh, there's not a built-in mechanism to 
control um, a multitude of, of JVMs all at once. So uh, this brings us to cryostat and how it can help. So uh, cryostat uh, is allows you to manage GFR recordings within containers. It's got a, a web application where you can create, manage, download recordings. And it does so by uh, connecting to a cryostat service that runs inside the cluster uh, right alongside your, your GVM applications. And it's cloud native, so it's uh, it knows how to uh, how to discover and uh, connect to compatible Kubernetes pods that are running Java applications. Uh, and it's more secure. So um, you don't need to expose the remote GMX connection outside of the cluster. Since Cryostat runs inside of the cluster, you're able to, to connect using just internal mechanisms. So the, uh, the, the remote GMX port is never accessible outside of the cluster. And one of the new features in Cryostat is it allows you to automate uh, recording management. So you can define rules to automatically create recordings for, for uh, matching JVMs. So this allows you to operate on multiple recordings at once. Some other features, uh, it allows you to archive recordings to persistent cloud storage. So if you've heard of Kubernetes persistent volumes before, uh, that allow, it allows you to uh, back up recordings that have happened inside of a, a JVM pod somewhere to persistent storage. Because as you know, like in, in, in Kubernetes, in the cloud, uh, these pods are ephemeral. So they're, 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 they can die at any time and be restarted. And uh, if that happens without backing up the recording, then you lose all of that information in that recording. So being able to back it up uh, in an easy way is, is very valuable. You can also uh, visualize metrics inside the cluster with Grafana. So Cryostat includes a uh, custom Grafana dashboard and data source that uh, allows you to plot curated metrics uh, in a curated time series metrics uh, all within inside the cluster. Uh, so you, it's a, a time saver there. You don't need to transfer the recording anywhere. But if that's not enough, because as I said, it's only uh, certain time series metrics, you can download the recording very easily to your local machine where you can perform offline analysis with all of the features of JMC. So just a little uh, brief history of our project. We started in 2019 as the uh, Container GFR project. You may have heard that name before. And then uh, earlier this year in April, we had our first 1.0 release. And uh, just last month, we had our 2.0 release, which marked the first release as a official Red Hat supported project, uh, product. And uh, it's you get support included automatically if you have a subscription to the Red Hat build of OpenJDK. And uh, with that, that new Cryostat 2.0 release, uh, there's a few features I want to highlight. So the first is the OpenShift operator. So it's now available to install out of the box on OpenShift 4.6 and higher uh, using the operator hub within the OpenShift console. And it makes it very easy to discover and uh, try out Cryostat in OpenShift. There's also the automated rules feature, which I briefly mentioned before. It allows you to automatically create recordings uh, for pods that match a particular main Java class, or if they have uh, you're looking for a particular Kubernetes labels or annotations on a on a pod, uh, you can create a rule to automatically uh, start recordings for those. Similarly, uh, there's a related batch operations feature that allows you to use that rules API to perform recording op uh, operations on multiple JVMs at once. Uh, so doing things like uh, archiving recordings uh, for many running JVMs all at once, that's easy to do now. And uh, finally, we have a custom targets feature. So if, you're, if your J Java application uses some protocol other than remote JMX for connections, then you're able to configure Cryostat to use that instead. So there's some added, added uh, customizability there. All right, so uh, now we're, we're done with the slides for now. I'm going to walk through a, a quick demo on how to install Cryostat in OpenShift using the operator. So I have uh, an instance of code-ready containers running now for this demo. And uh, I'm just in the administrator view. If we navigate to the operator hub, which is under the operators tab, 
you'll get a, a big list of operators that are available to install. So you can just search for cryostat. And click on it and just hit install. And uh, you can leave all of these alone. For the namespace, I'm going to use this DevNation namespace that I've created for this demo. And now it's just pulling the container images and setting up the deployment for the operator. While it's doing that, I want to highlight something else. So I have this CERT Manager operator uh, already installed. So CERT Manager allows uh, Cryostat to uh, secure and encrypt all traffic that it uses within, within inside the cluster. Uh, so that you can have end-to-end uh, -end encryption when you're connecting to Cryostat from outside the cluster. Uh, it just ensures that all network traffic related to Cryostat is encrypted uh, within the individual components and also when Cryostat connects to your GVM as well. So it's very useful to have. Um, it is possible to, to disable this functionality if you want when, you're, when you go to deploy your Cryostat instance, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, you can install it however you like. So we, we're just using the community operator right now, but there's other options as well that you can see on the CERT Manager website. Uh, we recommend using 1.3 1 or newer in order to work on OpenShift 4.9. And uh, if it's not installed and you didn't explicitly disable it when you're creating your Cryostat deployment, then uh, the operator will warn you about it using some warning events. So it's it's a bit, uh, it's a bit, uh, um, a bit of an extra step, but we want to make sure that we default to a secure deployment unless explicitly instructed otherwise. So, oh, yes, I have to change the namespace. Okay. So it's still installing, taking a bit longer than normal. Uh, just a question. This is a, yep. a CRC uh, 4.9. For which version of OpenShift are you running? Uh, so this version, I'm actually running a, a slightly older version. I believe it's based on 4.7. Yeah, 4.7.5. Okay, so the operator yep. supports uh, also uh, older version of OpenShift. Let's say 4.7, 4.8. Yes. So we we support uh, we support 4.6 and up. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, so like I mentioned before, with CERT Manager. Uh, using 1.3 or newer, it's because some APIs uh, were, were that were de previously deprecated were removed in uh, OpenShift 4.9 or Kubernetes 1.22. So you could run into problems there. So it's it's best to use a newer version. Okay, cool. interesting. Yep. Yeah, I wanted mm -hmm. to ask the audience if they have any question, please uh, send it, write it down in the chat. We will bring it uh, to the speaker. And also, I will uh, send the link to the uh, CRC. If you like to uh, run your OpenShift on your laptop, your workstation, download CRC, and, and you can also uh, install the Cryostat operator and do uh, try to do the same demo mm. uh, like today. Yeah, so I'm not sure why it's taking a bit longer than normal. Uh, I've, done, I've done this multiple times. It's just the, the curse of a live demo, I suppose. Of course, um, of course, it's live demo effect, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, otherwise, uh, we, we can, can try to delete it and redo it again. Uh, hmm. Or we can try on an uh, environment, uh, some, some like another cluster. Yeah, let me, uh, let me try deleting it with my, my CRC. But I do have a video prepared as a, as a backup if if all else fails. Yeah, yeah. Also, uh, we can. I, I know we are several other demos. We can jump in another demo and then come back mm -hmm. to this demo. Uh, I know we are full of demo today. So yeah. Super, super cool. Let me just quickly check my cluster status. That should be okay. And I like this logo of Cryostat. Yes, that's a, so. That's another uh, another new addition to the 2.0. It definitely feels like a 
uh, a complete project now that we have a logo. What about if we send out the t-shirt with this the super awesome logo to the people that send the first awesome question? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I would like one of those shirts myself. <laughs> So while we're waiting for your uh, installation to complete the rally, why don't we just jump into my side of the uh, demo really quick since sure. I have mine, um, mine installed too, so I can do that quickly. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So let me uh, go ahead and share this screen. Let's, let's see. Okay. <clears throat> oh, it, uh, looked a little funny there for a second, but I think we're okay. So we should be seeing my to-do app on the screen, right? Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, this may be familiar to some people in the audience, but if not, this is basically just a Quarkus application that does um, to-do management. You know, it's a list of to-do items. Um, so here I can write definition, I can write requests, and these are things to be done. So I can mark it as completed, or I can delete things, and I can remove all the ones that are completed. Um, pretty basic, simple Quarkus stuff. And this is my fork of the, uh, the app that somebody else has written. And in my fork, I've done a little bit of changes. Um, and what I've noticed in using it is that when I add uh, an item, uh, just sort of manually testing it, the request timing seems OK. 46 milliseconds might be a little bit on the slow side, terrible. Um, but I wrote a simulated load tester um, to hammer it with a bunch of requests to create uh, to-do items and then a bunch to delete them. And when I do that, I notice that the, the performance degrades really badly. So what I want to do is to use Cryostat to try to profile this thing and figure out you know, what actually is wrong here. Um, so I've got this deployed. You can kind of tell from uh, the URL. So I'm using CRC as well, and I have it in a namespace that I call my project. Um, so in the same namespace, my project, I've also deployed a Cryostat. Uh, and so if I'm going to log in here. Is I just need my OpenShift account token. So I'm using OT, who am I, dash T, copy it to clipboard, and then I can go ahead and paste it, and that'll get me into Cryostat. Um, so it's pretty simple. I'm just going to select the Quarkus to do app as the target to connect to, and then we're going to jump right to the events view. Uh, and we'll look at the event types. So, as Elliot said, there's a lot of uh, events that are built into the JVM. So, the vast majority of these are, are sort of intrinsic ones that come with. Um, the, the version of the JDK that this Quarkus to-do thing is built on top of. But I've actually added one custom event as well, um, specific to this application, and it's this resource API event. So whenever we get an HTTP API request, I'm going to record one of these events as well. Uh, and so when I capture my recording data, I can see that along with whatever else is included. Uh, and to go along with that, um, the JDK here has two kinds of profiling uh, or two kinds of templates, one profiling and one continuous monitoring built in. Um, so what I've done is I've gone ahead, I've downloaded the profiling one, edited it, it's just an XML document, and then I created a customized one here um, that is basically the same thing, but I added in a definition for my custom event as well so that it'll capture those. So I'll go ahead and add that one to Cryostat, and we can see here now I have this other um, to do template. And so I'm just going to start a recording off of that one. I'm going to name the recording DevNation. Uh, I'll make it continuous, which means that it's going to run until I explicitly stop the recording as well. Uh, and then I'm going to start it. And so once it's started, uh, over here again in my terminal, I'm going to run that load simulator that I talked about. I'm just going to make 30 requests um, to create and 30 requests to delete some to-do items. Uh, and you can see here, I've just given it the URL for the thing. OK, so it's already done. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording, because I don't really need that to run anymore. Um, and just to be safe, I'm going to archive it like we talked about before with Elliot. And so uh, oops, taking it a second to get into the archives. There it is. Um, so like I said, I know that we have some kind of request timing issue where it starts to take longer and longer. So I'm going to go ahead and just jump right into Grafana because I want to see that time series data we talked about. Um, and so because this has been deployed by the operator, it generates a password for the Grafana instance. Um, the username is well known, but the password is generated. So here I'm going to retrieve it from an OpenShift secret, copy it to my clipboard, and paste it in. And so once I'm in Grafana, 
I'm going to select the dashboard that comes pre-configured with this uh, container instance. So it's just there for use. And we'll just zoom in and take a look. So uh, you can see it was started at the right time. And the duration's off because it was continuous. So it doesn't know exactly how long it was. Um, but we can zoom in and see what's here. So we can see the CPU load looks a little bit higher than probably expected. Um, we can see some network utilization that looks like it would correspond to the request that I sent from the load simulator. And we can see some other things happening here, you know, a bit of, um, you know, compiler or JIT time and some safe points occurring. Um, but nothing else in this really stands out from what we can see here. And so what this tells me is that since I know there's a problem, but I can't see it here, uh, what I want to do is jump into JMC and take a closer look, you know, more of a deep dive into this data. That's really easy too. I can just download the recording. Uh, and what that's going to do is save it to my actual workstation here, to my local disk. Um, so I can open it up in JMC. So I've already opened JMC just to save us some time. Um, so let me just make that a little bigger. And then I'll uh, go ahead and open the file that I just downloaded. Uh, we're going to see the automated analysis do some stuff. That's cool. That's cool. I, I think Andrew a little bit freeze it, but uh, <laughs> it was super cool what it was showing. Uh, I love the fact that we, we connect uh, uh, from the dashboard. We can export, import, uh, and then we can also import here and have uh, this uh, uh, extended uh, report with uh, all settings. Um, so, hello, since yes. uh, waiting for Andrew to come back okay. from his Wi Fi issue. I was wondering, uh, what do you think this will uh, uh, finally mine the gap between, you know, monitoring uh, Java application on Kubernetes? Uh, you know, there we have lots mm -hmm. of tools, but uh, not the, the maybe not the native Java tools. And this probably this implementation, this on, on OpenShift on Kubernetes can help Java developers on Kubernetes uh, knowing more about the apps, uh, getting more metrics, and also learning from the metrics and maybe auto scale from a custom metric or stuff like that yeah so i think one of the the, the coolest things about gfr is its ability for uh, uh uh profiling and troubleshooting uh so there's lots of monitoring tools available um but um i think right now the the best use case for GFR is being able to find to uh, to find and diagnose performance issues in the application, um, and it, it gives like one of the the really nice things about it is is the events uh, they have stack trace information available so you can pinpoint exactly like which which methods are are being the problem. Uh, there are some some new new features in uh, in uh, uh, newer versions of Java in like JDK seventeen for example. Uh, where there's a, a streaming API uh, uh, for JFR, where you can actually uh, like st stream the the uh, the recording, uh, just like you would stream like a, a, a YouTube video, for example. Uh, so that's that's really exciting stuff. We think that that uh, opens uh, some uh, interesting possibilities with uh, with monitoring uh, in observability as well. Uh, so yeah, some some. Uh, some really cool things that JFR is capable of. That's great to hear. And actually, we have already some questions from the chat. DJ Medi, hey, hey, is a great fan of our show. So uh, he's asking, uh, uh, what is the impact running this 24-7 for catching problems in production? Right. So that is one of the the, the use cases that, that JFR is specifically made for. So um, I, I mentioned before that we have uh, different different uh, uh, um, templates for, for when you create your recording. There's two that are that are built in automatically. So one is for profiling, which has a bit more overhead, but uh, give, captures more information to, to uh, diagnose problems. Um, the other is for, is for uh, continuous or, or monitoring. Uh, so that's very low overhead. I think it's uh, about 1% or 2% um, performance overhead, and it's specifically designed to be to be uh, left on all the time during production. Uh, so typically, you could run that first. And then um, if you do notice that there are any problems there, then you can run an another recording uh, that's uh, the profiling one to, to do sort of a deep dive into where the problem is occurring. 
at the expense of a little more overhead. Mm -hmm. that, that's cool. That's interesting. And uh, um, there are also other questions from the chat. Mm -hmm. um, there's uh, Sanjev asking, uh, does the use of uh, JFRs slow down the application? Can we use it in production? Is uh, Again, can we use it in production? But uh, yes. in this case, does it slow down the application? What is the footprint of adding this? Uh, yeah, so like I, I think it's uh, about one or two percent for the uh, the um, the monitoring use case where you use the the continuous uh, uh, event template in in Cryostat. Um, so it is it is definitely designed to leave on in production usage all the time. That's great to hear. And there's also Chet asking, are there plans to integrate with OpenShift for mm -hmm. single sign-on? Uh, yeah, so that's that's something that we're working on right now, actually, um, in order to be able to to not require you to manually uh, paste your token in when you log into Cryostat, but just to uh, have a similar experience to what you see with the OpenShift console, um, where if you're already logged in, it'll it will just automatically redirect you to Cryostat and get your credentials from the single sign-on. So, um, so yes, that is something we're definitely working on. Cool, cool. So thanks for the question in the in the chat. Please keep question. Uh, please send in the question. I don't know if uh, Helliot can send a T-shirt, uh, but uh, <laughs> for sure. As soon as I get one. <laughs> for sure, you can uh, answer uh, to your question. Hey, Andrew, welcome back. Hey, yeah. Uh, it seems like I was a little cursed there with the Wi-Fi dropping out again. No problem, no problem. Yeah, we were um, talking uh, about, there was some question in the chat, moreover question about uh, what is the footprint of using this tool in production, let's say an open shift in production, uh, what is the what is the load uh, that we may have? And uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, DJ Medi was liking your demo where you were using PB Pest. <laughs> he learned how to use that. Uh, but also I was uh, mentioning to Elliot, if, if it, it is very cool to see that uh, we can finally have uh, something to gather more metrics, uh, more info from our application, our Java application, and also the capability to use also external tool for visualization of the reports. In the demo, you were showing uh, 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 an extended uh, report for, for the Java uh, run, uh, uh, for the Java app run. So that's cool. Um, there's Nikolai, if you don't mind asking, if uh, is JDK 17 supported? Yeah, uh, so JDK 17 is definitely supported. Uh, as long as you're using a JDK where you can enable JMX, basically, then Cryostat can talk to it and it can enable JFR. Um, JFR is definitely built into OpenJDK 17. Um, so uh, as long as you can enable your JMX uh, flags, basically, when you're starting your JVM, then uh, it's supported. Um, JDK 17 does have JFR event streaming, so this might have been a question about that. Uh, in that case, that's something we're looking at and planning to work on, um, but we're not using event streaming yet. OK, thanks. Um, there's Alan in the chat asking, by deep dive, method layer, yes? Uh, maybe, yeah. Yeah, so um, if you're when you're doing a, uh, when you're capturing events in uh, with JFR, then it does give you uh, a stack trace with with which methods are are uh, captured in each event. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. But uh, the question were coming. Uh, you know, uh, the the people looks very interested on, on this tool. And uh, Helio, I don't know if uh, uh, we want to continue on. Uh, on that part of the demo, or do you want to show something about uh, the tool again? Uh, yeah, I can. I can uh, uh, walk through the video of uh, installing an OpenShift. So I figured out what the problem was. There's apparently a uh, outage with the, the <laughs> Red Hat Container Registry. Per perfect timing, right? Uh, uh, so yeah, I'll just I'll just quickly use the video I have prepared. There's uh, um, about four minutes to it, so not too much. That's cool. DJ Medi uh, is looking forward to play with it. Uh, you raised all the interest from our, our audience. Excellent. 
Okay, so uh, yeah, assuming that uh, the re the container registry is actually working, here's uh, the cryostat uh, operator successfully installed. So if we click on it, you can see that you get prompted to create a cryostat instance to use this operator. Uh, so that is basically a configuration resource on how you want to actually deploy cryostat in your OpenShift namespace. Uh, so by default, it's just called cryostat sample. Uh, there's a few a few options here uh, that you can just leave as default when you're deploying it. And uh, so in order to check if it's up and running, you can go to the resources tab uh, for your cryostat resource. And you can see all of these are all of the, the, the OpenShift objects that are owned by the cryostat resource. So, um, you, you can see all the, the deployment and services. So there's quite a bit that goes into actually deploying Cryostat. So it's nice that the operator is able to, to handle that for you. So here are some of the options you can use to configure Cryostat. Minimal deployment. So if you want, if you don't want any of the Grafana integration, save on some resources, you can set that to, to, to true uh, at the expense of some features. Uh, the cert manager integration. So as I said before, if you don't want to use cert manager to secure the communication inside the cluster. Um, the, the external traffic will still be secured, but inside the cluster, if you don't want that, you just set it to false. Uh, and then it'll allow, allow you to proceed without cert manager. Uh, event templates, uh, like I, I mentioned before. Um, so these, these, these templates specify which record, which events you are interested in for, for the, when you create the JFR recording. Um, so it includes the default profiling and uh, continuous monitoring events. Uh, but of course, you probably want to customize them uh, with events that you're, you're interested in yourself. So you can add them here, and that will pre-configure Cryostat so that these templates will be available uh, automatically when Cryostat starts up. And these are, these are added using uh, Kubernetes config maps, by the way. Uh, storage options. So uh, I've talked before about uh, being able to archive your, your recordings to persistent storage. So uh, the operator does this using a persistent volume claim by default with 500 megabytes of storage and the default storage class. So if you want to customize this to uh, adjust the amount of storage that you want to give Cryostat or use a particular uh, storage class, then you could do that here by, by specifying it in the, the PVC spec. Uh, next feature is the trusted TLS certificates. So uh, if you are connecting securely from Cryostat to your applications uh, using TLS uh, over, over the remote JMX, then you need to configure Cryostat to trust your, your uh, application's TLS certificates. So that's where you would do this here. Uh, you add them, you add them uh, in uh, Kubernetes secrets, so you would uh, you need to have your, your application certificates in the local namespace inside of a secret. Um, so you give the name of the secret and then also the path within that secret that points to the certificate. And finally, network options. So this doesn't apply on OpenShift, but if you're running the operator in Kubernetes, then you need to define these uh, ingress for each, uh, for each of the services that Cryostat uses to, not to allow uh, traffic from outside the cluster to go inside of the cluster to the cryostat services. Uh, with OpenShift, that's handled automatically with routes. So uh, once once the uh, the cryostat deployment is ready, which you can see it's running, uh, then you can go back to the cryostat uh, uh, resource, and there's an application URL link, and that'll take you straight to the cryostat web application. All right, so that is uh, the whole demo I wanted to cover. That's great. That's great because the operator give uh, lots of control of setting that you can use. Um, and uh, we have, uh, I shared in the chat the link to the source uh, repo of the operator. Um, right, thank you. I have a question from the chat and also I have a question I would like to ask you. So the question in the chat is from Nikolai, I say, um, is it, uh, two questions. Uh, did you try with Graal VM and is there a list of supported JDK version? Uh, Andrew, do you want to fill that one? 
Sure, yeah. So uh, JDK versions for OpenJDK or Hotspot, it's, as Elliot said, uh, 8U272 or newer, um, or any JDK 11 or newer. So um, as long as you have that, then JFR is built into those. And all of those would also be able to um, enable JMX communication so Cryosat can talk to it. Um, GraalVM is a bit of a challenge for us. Um, Graal doesn't really have the same, uh, uh, some of the same, you know, infrastructure within it for JFR and JMX. Um, so I, if you're building with Graal and you're uh, able to build it into JVM mode, then I think you're okay. Um, same with Quarkus, like Quarkus native build doesn't work, but Quarkus JVM mode does. Um, again, because Quarkus, J, uh, Quarkus native mode doesn't have uh, JMX, although it does more recently, I believe, have JFR. Same with Graal. Um, the latest ones, there is uh, a way to do native builds with JFR, but they don't do JMX. And so Cryosat's not able to talk to them. So that's the limitation there. Okay, interesting. That, 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 that is an interesting point. Um, and, I, and I hope uh, this uh, address your question, Nikolai. And I have also a question from my side. So uh, I see the operator is uh, uh, available on GitHub. And I, I was wondering if that is available also on operatorhub.io or, or not. Uh, it's not right now. Uh, it's something that we're actively working on. Uh, but right now, it's only available within OpenShift's uh, embedded operator hub. OK, so OpenShift uh, user will uh, have the, this operator in the cluster. Yes. Cool. Cool. Uh, and in any version, let's say OpenShift 4.6, 4.7, 4.8, 4.9. Right. Any, anything 4.6 or newer, it's it's there. Cool. Super cool. So if you have any OpenShift available, uh, you can start using on it. Uh, if, you, if you don't have it yet, uh, you can uh, get it from uh, code-ready containers. Uh, we don't have it yet on developer sandbox for OpenShift. Uh, hopefully, we'll have also uh, this operator, for, which is very helpful for debugging a uh, Java application. Um, uh, uh, the question, I don't know, I'm looking at the chat. Uh, DJ Medi say that wanted to ask about the Quarkus native mode. OK, uh, Andrew already answered uh, this. Uh, and so another question from you, from my side, what's next for next development, next feature? Well, what's next for this project? Uh, so uh, one, one thing we're working on right now is uh, uh, adding a, a Helm chart in addition to the operator so that there's more flexibility for deploying it on, uh, say, uh, less privileged environments, like you mentioned, the developer mm -hmm. sandbox. Um, and also, that that might help us uh, in some Kubernetes situations as well. Um, so yeah, we're, we're trying to add some more flexibility there. OK, cool. Then. Yeah, that, that, that was interesting. You know, um, for, let's say, Kubernetes cloud environment with some restriction, if we also have the end chart that is uh, uh, helpful for kind of a restricted cluster. But if you have a full OpenShift cluster and you get it at ease from Operator Hub, um, I see there are lots of uh, uh, settings from uh, that you can put in, in the Operator. Um, uh, and and I, I think it's very cool. It's very powerful. Is there any also way to... Um, I've seen also the, uh, the dashboard, which is very cool using a pattern fly. So the look and feel is not that different from OpenShift. It's kind of the same experience. Is there any plan of improvement also on, on that side, like uh, adding new feature in the operator or exporting uh, files or adding new feature in the dashboard, more integration on the dashboard? Yeah, so I'll take that one. Um, the Crossat web client, we call it, which is the dashboard you're talking about that's built with uh, Patternfly. Um, we do want to improve that and continue working on it. Um, but currently, our, our plan of action is to try to figure out what our plan should be. Um, we have a lot of ideas of capabilities and features we can build into the core Cryosat product itself. Um, but when it comes to trying to display that and build a you know a UI around it, it becomes a lot more challenging technically um, to just try to figure out how do we expose all these capabilities in a way that makes sense visually. Um, so it's it's on our work list. Uh, it might take a little bit of time. It's not really something we're committing to for the next release necessarily, but it's for sure on our on our plate. Uh, one thing is, for example, the automated rules that Elliot talked about. Um, 
you can currently create an automated rule uh, using the HTTP API. So, you know, with uh, curl or whatever you like, um, but we don't have a UI for that yet. And that's something I'm planning to build out um, for the batch operations where you can perform uh, an action like starting a recording across uh, or archiving a recording across some, you know, some set, some selection of JVMs. Um, that's also something that we need to think about how we're going to expose that as an interface graphically. Um, right now, our UI is kind of oriented toward one JVM at a time, but the API is more powerful than that. Um, so yeah, we're, we're trying to work through um, how do we reorient ourselves graphically and visually to, um, to make things powerful, but also understandable. Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, um, I think uh, we are uh, we, we're almost at uh, the end of the session. I would like to thank you for joining this tech talk today about Cryostat and how this brings uh, uh, more um, functionality in uh, for Java developers on Kubernetes. Uh, thanks to uh, the support for JDK Flight Recorder uh, on Kubernetes. We have seen also a nice demo of this operator on how to install at ease from OpenShift. Uh, there's a final question from DJ Made. Let's say if we can ma manage to, to do that. Uh, any plans for Ansible module for that? Oh, uh, not currently. It's, it's not something we've looked at at least yet. Uh, right now, we're just mainly focusing on our, our Go operator and uh, beginning to look at Helm. Cool. Thanks. Thanks. So yeah, the, so the Elm chart looks really something that is uh, upcoming. It's really cool. So we can install also on developer end of, for OpenShift. I will put in the chat the link to the to the website of the project, so you can go into the website and uh, check the documentation and try and start installing on on your OpenShift cluster. Um, uh, oh, there's another question. You know, maybe they, they all, all want this T-shirt that we are <laughs> we said at the beginning. Any feature for monitoring communication between Java containers, or it's made for debugging individual containers? This is a generic question. So. Uh, monitoring communication between Java containers. I don't know if that. Uh... Yeah, so I think this is probably the question is about if you have Java microservices and you have microservices that form a larger application. Um, I'm assuming that we're going to go with that. That's how I'm interpreting. Um, so that's a big thing that the JFR community as a whole is trying to work toward is to um, come up with a way to sort of be able to produce your um, synthesized JFR data because you know the world is moving a lot toward microservices and having a larger application composed of smaller pieces. So the communication between containers is a big thing. Um, and so there's a lot of efforts around tracing, um, trying to trace requests that move between services that represent one sort of logical client customer request. Um, so currently we don't have any feature built in for that. Um, but that's definitely related to open telemetry, open tracing, and there are bridges between open tracing and open telemetry and JFR. Uh, and this is an area that we're actively exploring to try to get something um, built around that for Cryosat as well. So not yet, but uh, yeah, try to keep an eye out, I guess. That's super cool. Also having a reference architecture of all these tools, uh, using all uh, the, the, the best of all these tools that uh, you're also mentioning. Uh, it's definitely worth. So looking forward to uh, any blog post on developersredout.com uh, for the new development uh, for Cryostat. Um, other than that, I really thank you, Elliot and Andrew, for this awesome tech talk. Thanks for the demo. Thanks for the uh, lots of questions uh, today. Um, uh, and looking forward to see you on the next uh, tech talk here at DevNation. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.